Okay, everybody. We're going to get started with the last part of the program, if you can all settle down. It's great that everybody's having such a good time. And in fact, I was surprised that no one put my father up in the chair and danced him around the room. I expected Gene and Roman and Jerry to lead the charge over there. What's up with you guys? Um, so it's uh, truly a pleasure for me uh, to introduce our final speaker, maybe our second to final speaker, because uh, my father will have the final word as usual. But uh, <laughs> it's a, an honor for me to introduce Gene Brownwald. Gene is truly a man who needs no introduction. And I could step off the stage now, but that would probably be rude. <laughs> So just to summarize, to the people in this town, Gene is best known for having been chairman of medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital from 1972 to 1996, an incredible tenure. Chief Academic Officer of Partners Healthcare System, the founding chairman of the renowned Timmy Study Group at Brigham and Women's Hospital, the founding editor, editor of Brownwald's Heart Disease, the world's leading cardiovascular textbook, and along with my father, an editor of Harrison's Principles of Internal Medicine for over three decades. So, Gene. Is that on? No, it's fine. Well, thank you. Uh, hi, Kurt. The reason I'm up here is because I think that I have known Kurt longer than anyone in this room. Uh, not longer than Rhoda, but almost. So this is actually our 59th anniversary. <laughs> so as you've heard, Kurt was born in Germany and uh, uh, and as you can see, life was peaceful for young Kurt and very supportive within the Islobaka family. In 1936, after the dark shadow descended over Germany, 10-year-old Kurt, his uh, parents and uh, grandfather fled the country, but they left behind many relatives who subsequently uh, died in concentration camps. Um, I think you've heard pieces of this uh, this afternoon and from um, uh, Dan, but um, Kurt went to Harvard College and it was during World War II. He entered in 1944 and he graduated in 1946. There were accelerated programs at the time. He went to Harvard Medical School. Then he had his medical residency at the MGH, and went to the NIH in 1953. And it was in 1956, in early 1956, when we met. So he, Kurt, worked with a distinguished biochemist, Herman Kalkar, um, and fresh out of residency, he recognized and um, described the defect in galactosemia. This was the first hereditary disease for which a specific enzymatic defect was identified. Now these discoveries later resulted in a test for the disease which is used routinely in newborns to screen. And this was a major advance which had led to the elimination of milk, which contains this offending uh, agent. So uh, I was a newbie at the NIH, uh, coming um, uh, two years after he did. And there was a program where the, um, uh, the older guys uh, presented uh, their research. So I heard him. Uh, present this paper on galactosemia, um, and the, uh, not only the clinical description, but the biochemical description. And um, I said to myself, my God, this man has described a new condition, and the mechanism of this new condition, 
I don't really fit in this place. <laughs> what am I doing here? Now, this was a time in the 1950s when eponyms, the, the names for diseases and given diseases, the, the names of their discoverers was very common. And it would have been more than appropriate for this to be called Isselbacher's disease. But Pert was very careful, as we have heard and as we all know, very, very careful. He didn't want to close his options on this. <laughs> and I'll describe that a little later to see how wise he was. Well, after he finished his three years in Bethesda, he returned to the uh, MGH. And uh, Dr. Bauer, who was the legendary chief of medicine, um, who um, had uh, the most uh, superb taste in academic horseflesh, and really um, altered the scene um, uh, during his tenure uh, by the selection of extraordinary people to run the divisions. And um, as uh, was implied earlier, um, uh, he called Kurt into his office and uh, told him that there were two senior people on the staff that were retiring. One of them was Fuller Albright, who was a remark remarkable scholar, an extraordinary world-renowned gastroenterologist, excuse me, endocrinologist. <laughs> and the other one was Chester Jones, who was a leading clinical gastroenterologist. So Bauer said to uh, Isselbacher, which one of these do you want? This is a Friday afternoon. And, um, and uh, he said, tell me on Monday. So Kurt went back and he analyzed this as, you know, he is as an analytic person as I've ever met. And he felt that if he went, he didn't know anything about either field. <laughs> uh, but he felt that, that endocrinology had a much larger scientific base at the time than gastroenterology. And so he was, did not want to be a small fish in a large pond. So he uh, chose gastroenterology uh, because from an academic point of view, it was uh, a smaller pond at the time. So um, uh, he told Bauer about that, and, and um, Bauer said, OK. And then Kurt said to him, but you know, I don't really know any gastroenterology. And Bauer said, people aren't born gastroenterologists. <laughs> and he said, you're very bright. There's not that much to learn. <laughs> Take two weeks off. <laughs> well, so obviously he, uh, uh, he headed the division and um, uh, in 1968, Kurt was asked to consult in the emergency room of the MGH on a 10-year-old boy with acidosis. Now, I don't know why. I guess their pediatric service wasn't yet uh, fully developed. Some people think it hasn't developed yet. Uh, but uh, uh, that's bad. <laughs> well, now what Kurt noted, he noted uh, a strange odor coming from this boy. He described it as, quote, sweaty feet. And this confirms that he was an astute clinician. To make a long story short, this was a short chain fatty uh, acid. He and a colleague, uh, Kay Tanaka, identified the offending agent as a, uh, an unusual substance, isovaleric acid. And that led to the initial description of another hereditary disorder, isovaleric acidemia, Isselbacher's second disease. As a result of a congenital enzyme, this um, fatty acid uh, 
uh, rises, and um, uh, it's a dreadful condition, and it opened new areas of research. They then went on, Kurt then went on to describe a previously unrecognized, quite common syndrome of postoperative jaundice that has become identified as a very distinct clinical entity. So this could be called Hisselbacher number three disease. Well, as Kurt headed the unit, he became recognized as the world's leading academic gastroenterologist. Um, after three decades at the helm of what had become the world's premier GI division, Kurt embarked on a major career change, and many of his friends, like myself, were quite surprised. In the late uh, 1980s, uh, the MGH recognized a need for a major expansion of its cancer program, and they began to search for a director to lead the cancer center. So now for the second time, the MGH made a surprising but correct decision when it selected Kurt for this post. And as you know, he left the GI division in the exceptionally capable hands of Dan Podolsky, um, and uh, whom we heard earlier. Uh, and Kurt created the MGH Cancer Center and fashioned it into one of the leading such research centers in the world. He was instrumental in the establishment of MGH East, because he wasn't going to take this position unless there was adequate space, and there was adequate space in MGH East. So at the Cancer Center with Daniel Haber, Kurt played a critical role in identifying specific mutations in the BCRA1 gene, hereditary breast cancer. His combined interest in gastroenterology hadn't given up on gastroenterology, and cancer led him to studies on the genetic derangement that caused both breast and colon cancer. And uh, his group developed a number of models of GI malignancy. Quite recently, and Kurt remains active, they've studied circulating cancer cells in patients with solid tumors. And, uh, I think that's a remarkable finding. Um, in a paper published a couple of years ago, um, they showed that one in a billion circulating cells can be a cancer cell, and that that can have significance in metastasis. So obviously, this work has uh, profound implications, um, both for clinical um, um, oncology as well as uh, uh, the understanding of metastatic disease. Now again, um, when the time came, uh, Kurt uh, chose a successor, and his name was Dan. So there's something going on here. So the, you know, what, are the, what are the chances that if you get to have two uh, professional lives, um, each of them outstanding, okay, how many people like that, and then, and then uh, selecting uh, one's successor, and that the names would be Dan, twice. <laughs> what are the odds? Well, again, the second Dan was an equally brilliant uh, appointment. Um, this is the, um, uh, you've, you've seen this before, so, uh, uh, but, but this is the uh, uh, GI division um, that uh, Kurt inherited. This is in 1959, three years later. Kurt is um, the third from the right, and his predecessor uh, is just uh, um, next to him, uh, uh, Dr. Jones. And this is the uh, GI unit um, in 1988, and you see Kurt again, um, the uh, uh, third from the right, that hasn't changed. And then you see Dan Podolsky uh, at the uh, far right end, um, his uh, smiling successor. 
Now, in uh, 1967, Kurt and I both became editors of Harrison's, and, um, uh, and uh, we worked together on uh, uh, this book for nine editions, and I learned a tremendous amount of cardiology and every aspect of medicine from Kurt. As you could imagine, his precision and his imagination and creativity and his ability to shorten the chapters was extraordinary. And this is, um, um, this is a, um, a picture of the six editors. Um, you can see um, over on your far left, uh, Joe Martin, who had just come on as, a, as a chief of uh, neurology at the MGH. Uh, next to him is Bob Petersdorf. Uh, Gene Wilson, from uh, endocrinologist from the Southwestern. Ray Adams, who was the um, retiring uh, uh, chief of uh, neurology at the MGH, Kurt. And I guess I'm the only one in sunglasses. Um, so uh, uh, Kurt's contributions are enormous. In addition to his signal contributions to the Mass General, Kurt has also been one of the most influential and constructive members of the Harvard's medical faculty. And, you know, Harvard has honored uh, Kurt by establishing not one, but two endowed professorships in his name, because he has created two uh, separate, distinct, and incredible uh, programs. Um, Kurt has many honors, and I won't give them all to you. You've heard them several times. But the point I want to make is if you go through his CV and you see all the honors, one thing that I do know from my close association for 59 years, he is not a self-promoter. And that is quite unusual in academic medicine at this time. All the honors that he's received have come to him. And that's quite uncharacteristic. So, um, uh, one of his awards is the Friedenwald Medal, uh, which is the uh, uh, most distinguished medal that the American Gastroenterology Association makes. And here is uh, Kurt and Rhoda in 1985, a very happy moment for them and for the association. Um, so, uh, here is the family, and as you uh, have heard from Eric, that uh, quite distinct from uh, uh, his uh, extraordinary professional attainments, uh, is um, uh, the not the academic family, but the personal family. So, Kurt, uh, you are uh, first and foremost a mensch. Uh, you exemplify the highest values of academic medicine. Uh, you have made uh, enormous contributions as a caring, empathetic clinician, as we've heard from Dan, as a devoted and inspiring mentor, and continuing as a creative and productive scientist. And you have certainly advanced the care of patients with gastrointestinal disorders and cancer um, while training generations of gastroenterologists and scientists. So it has been and it is an honor for me and a privilege to be your friend and to join with your many friends here and elsewhere, colleagues and former trainees, to wish you a happy birthday. And I too look forward to celebrating your birthday again in a decade. Thank you.
Well, you can't believe everything you hear. <laughs> I don't believe half of it. I listened, but I didn't think it was me. So I was reminded of the story of the, uh, the rabbi who was being introduced by his congregation by the trustee who was waxing prophetic about the rabbi, saying, this man is so intelligent that even the wisest come to him for advice, and children sit at his feet. And he's so empathetic that he goes out and visits patients, people who are suffering day and night. And he's so understanding of people that both men and women come and reveal to him their most secret uh, affairs. And this is a man, and the rabbi said, tugging at the trustee's sleeve, don't forget to mention my humility. <laughs> Nobody talked about my humility today. So, uh, 